Jones. In the meantime, let's crack on with our Friday panel, uh, shall we, and get into some of the other big stories kicking about this week, as usual. Johnny Burrow, a broadcaster, a journalist, joins us, uh, as as does George Gilhurley as well, who is a journalist. Uh, Georgia, Johnny, hello, good evening to you both. Hi, good to be here. Oh, thank good to have you on, uh, Georgia. Hi, Johnny. Thank you for um, for being with us tonight. We, we might touch on Brittany before 11 tonight because it, it, it is a really big story. Uh, I know it's just sort of broken in the last couple of minutes, so I don't want to catch you guys off guard uh, too much. But um, uh, but it, but it's it's very significant, actually, isn't it? Very, very significant. Um, uh, firstly, uh, MPs and second jobs. I was saying at the start of the show, uh, uh, Georgia, we'll start with you on this one, that um, uh, you know, we're at risk of throw, throwing MPs into, into one um, uh, big basket of corruption here, and that's not what's going going on but right at the heart of it are second jobs i'll ask you quite quite simply uh, a, a yes or no and then feel free to expand should mps be allowed to have second jobs yeah i think absolutely in general they should be allowed to have second jobs um i think the issue is where there's a conflict of interest with you know the the public service as an mp also you know time constraints another thing I guess there are sort of a few categories. You could have someone who, let's say they were practicing as a dentist or a nurse before they're an MP, and they do a bit of that on the side mm. while they're still an MP. Which some that do, don't they? I mean, that's, that's, that's not hypothetical. Yeah, some of course, do especially do throughout the pandemic, we saw people, you know, pitching, uh, MPs rather pitching in, mm. you know, with care work, with, with uh, medical work, that kind of thing, which mm. is obviously a good help. And then you have sort of, I guess, another thing, which would be more lucrative work, let's say legal aid work, something like Keir Starmer and obviously sort of, uh, I guess, infamously now, Sir Geoffrey Cox has been involved with. Um, that's something that's quite lucrative, but it isn't necessarily a conflict of interest, depending on what kind of law they're working on. Uh, also, banking, another sort of thing um, that, that is, that's lucrative, not necessarily always a conflict of interest. But then you have sort of the third thing, which can be quite vague. We hear this word consulting thrown around, around you know, I know people my age who are working consulting and it's one of those things you never quite know what actually is. And when it's someone who's an MP or a peer, what it generally means is because they're in parliament, they're being paid to speak up for a certain issue, be it, I don't know, food standards, some kind of COVID uh, sort mm. of uh, product that mm. helps with uh, stopping COVID or whatever. Hand sanitizer. Um, <laughs> I mean, who, who was it? Yeah, who, hand sanitizer, who, sorry. That's who, the kind who of thing was it? I was well, who, was, of, yeah. who, who was a Tory MP who was literally, he was literally working for, he was consulting a hand sanitizer company uh, and then he was, but he was also uh, chairing or was on a body or something that recommended to the government hand sanitizers as being a good thing to use during a pandemic. I mean, they are, so it could be a coincidence. I mean, they actually are. It's not a totally ludicrous thing to suggest, uh, but it but it does, it has, uh -huh. a, it has a bad smell to it. It's a really bad smell, doesn't it? Um, uh, Johnny, are you going are you going to sort of and, and I'm, I'm with with Georgia I think on this one that 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 you know not all second jobs second jobs perhaps aren't the problem but but what the second jobs are is or is there an argument that actually if you're an MP you should just be an MP that's your job it's a big enough job just crack on with it well I, I think if you're an MP you should be an MP um and I wouldn't call for a blanket ban on second jobs because it's a very good point Georgia made about that you know, doctors returning to work in a pandemic, care workers returning to work. If you're doing something extra that is really, really helping, then great. But I appreciate the conflict of interest concerns. They're significant. I actually think it's often a bit more basic than that. It's just pragmatic. It's logistics. How many hours are there in a day? And how are we viewing the job of an MP? Because actually, if you're dealing with thousands, tens of thousands of constituents, you're meant to be in Westminster taking part in various debates and votes and so on. If you're doing the job well, you should also be dealing with specific casework for specific constituents. I don't personally believe that you can do that job well and do, say, being a high-level consultant or lawyer or doctor, for that matter, if we're being honest, to a high level as well. Mm. It's one thing to do a couple of hours here and there added on. And listen, if you can get really well paid for doing that and it's not getting in the way of your work as an MP, then I can see an argument for that. And I don't think we should ban it on principle. But I think the idea that you can juggle two massive jobs or three massive jobs, I mean, the figures with Conservative MP Ben Bradley, for example, where he reckons he's doing 60 hours somewhere and 60 hours somewhere else and 60 hours somewhere else, it, it doesn't add up. And whatever you're doing, whether you've got another job or not, all of your work as an MP has to be the number one thing. And if it isn't, don't be an MP. 
It's mm, a fair point. And also, what a, a really fair point is, how do you find the time to do that kind of mm. stuff? I mean, I, I think it, I mean, Jeffrey Cox is obviously, the, is obviously the one that's been thrown around a lot at the moment, and it's, it's perhaps the, the, the starkest example, but doesn't that sort of clock up his working week to 150 hours? <laughs> something, something ridiculous like that. I think that. it's probably easier if you're in the Cayman Islands. Well, that's very assume. true. That's not a, a fair point. <laughs> fair point. But I, I mean, I do, like, I do two shows a week here, and I'm exhausted. I don't know where I find, I can barely find the time to clean up a litter tray or like put the pasta on of an evening it's absolutely exhausted um it, it's a fair point uh, georgia um on on a sort of broader point then and we're going to talk about this on the show tomorrow night because we're going to have a fuller conversation about the prospect of paying mps more right which I know is sort of like it's it's one of those things that makes people recoil, and um, and it's a really hard argument to make. But once you start to get into the detail, there is a compelling case whether you wholeheartedly sign up to it or not. Just pay aside. What else can we do to to, to sort of clean up this institution that is being a member of Parliament? And 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 I say that advisedly. I say that, I say that because actually. You know, I say that with also recognising that it isn't all of them and, and that there are some of them that do very good work and that are incredibly dedicated. We spent a lot of the, the show two or three weeks ago talking about how good MPs are and how much good they can do in, in light of David Amos's death. But generally speaking, what tweaks need to be made at this point? What can, what can we learn, Georgia? I mean, the problem is that with some of these cases like Owen Patterson and with elements of what Geoffrey Cox appears to have done that say conducting um, the business uh, of his external work on the parliamentary estate, which is against the rules. So it's already against the rules. Um, so it's whether people are coming forward about that or there's evidence of it mm. to then sort of go ahead with, you know, an investigation, possible suspension, that kind of thing. Um, and then also there's sort of, I mean, there's the issue of, like I said, the vagueness of some consultancy roles, but you also have the problem it, uh, of when people are in a consultancy role for that, say, a certain company that has a certain interest in a certain vote, they can speak on that issue in Parliament. All they have to do is just uh, declare it officially. So we need to think about maybe is that the best way of handling it? Um, how many people are involved in that kind of thing? Um, they're still influenced. Uh, sort of how much are they getting paid? Is it more um, than their MP's salary? I've heard some people suggest possibly, you know, that's, you know, let them have jobs, but it can't pay them more than the MP's salary. Mm. I feel like it's very complicated to sort of think about these things. And um, I don't know if there's, you know, an easy solution. There obviously isn't. In terms of paying MPs more, I think logically it's not necessarily the wrong thing to do, <laughs> but I think that it's a very, very, very bad look with, you know, rising costs of living. The fact that it's already way above um, the national average salary, even though it is below the salary of some um, other public servants, say certain civil servants, NHS consultants, that kind of thing. So it's not sort of ludicrous, but it is quite high. Yeah. So and, I don't think it's a good luck. And, and Georgia, here, here's the issue. Here's the issue, right, with politics. You just summed up the problem with politics there in an, an absolute nutshell. That <laughs> the, 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 uh, practically, the right thing to do can be politically the wrong thing to do. And that's um, and around we go and around we go and around we go. Georgia, Johnny, hang on there. The Friday panel is on Talk Radio. More next. Uh, Johnny Burrow and uh, Georgia Gilholy join us tonight, uh, broadcasters and journalists on the Friday panel to get into some of the big stories of the week. And we've we've sort of navigated our, our, our way around this um, this this second job thing. At large, there's another issue here, right? Um, in that it's starting to to smell uh, and it's starting to stick. And there is a poll tonight that I can bring you, uh, literally in the last couple of minutes or so. Uh, a Savanta poll, com uh, Comrades poll, has uh, put the Labour Party five points up on 40 and the Tories down four on 34 points. Now, these kind of rise and fall and, you know, I mean, come on, let's, let's, sp let's splash a load of salt uh, all over this conversation because we know what polling is like. Uh, but Georgia, how significant is this, given that we have seen this Tory poll lead stick and stick and stick and stick it is, it's been almost unpenetrable uh, in the last since since 2019 really uh bar a, 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 a short blip perhaps around no october november last year when we went into that second lockdown is this the moment the tide changes yeah i think i think that um it is quite telling that there's been a dip for the tories um uh, uh, during this uh, issue and not, you know, all the subsequent issue, uh, the previous issues rather over the past year or so, um, and all the U-turns and scandals, COVID contracts, etc., the lockdown sort of controversies. Um, so I think that it's clear that this has stuck in a certain way and it sort of rumbles on from uh, last week with the Patterson probe and the U-turn on that, obviously, which just sort of looked embarrassing. 
um, and Johnson not turning up to the debate on the um, uh, the second debate this week, um, scheduled by the Lib Dems, sort of he, by being absent, he caused more of an issue than he would have, you know, if he was there, because it makes him look, I guess, guilty. Um, I think the problem is, though, that this will only maybe continue to benefit Labour if they provide a credible alternative for the country. I do sort of think even looking at this poll, I tend to think that, you know, if there was actually an election tomorrow, the Tories still probably would win. Um, I think that Labour, you know, their stance on this isn't even particularly strong. They, they're sort of um, criticising certain uh, issues, like, of course, the Patterson issue. Um, today, you know, Angela Rayner wrote about, uh, to um, the Standards Commissioner to call for an investigation into Geoffrey Cox. Um, but they're not officially, I don't believe they're officially calling to, let's say, ban second jobs, which obviously a lot of the Labour grassroots on online um, and activists and columnists, those kind of sort of people in the media are calling for. And of course, you know, Keir Starmer himself has been in the headlines this week over some of his legal work, which from what I've seen, you know, it's not it's not against the rules or anything, but it sort of makes him look, you know, I suppose like a hypocrite. So I think that this looks bad, but we don't really know where it's going yet. And also what happens with Labour themselves affects their you know, ability to cap, uh, capitalise on this in terms of actual votes. Mm. Um, and also, this is the kind of thing that it's going to stick with across all parties. I think that there are more, from the figures I've seen recently, I think that there are more um, Conservative MPs making money outside of Parliament, but there are also um, some very similar issues on the other side of the House. Um, so I don't think it's something that sort of, you know, Labour are whiter than white on, so no, to speak. No, but no, but I... I, I, I... Look, you, you, listen, you, you, I'm sort of uh, um, stand uh, here accused of making an obvious point, and I'm sure, no doubt, somebody will be uh, constructing a text to tell me that I'm a, a communist traitor in a moment, <laughs> but any, any minute. But actually, it is it is, it is is predominantly Tories that we're talking about here, right? And, and particularly around the Owen Paterson case as well. You know, that was every single member of parliament who voted uh, in favour of, um, of, of uh, uh, abandoning that uh, suspension and, and ripping up the Standards Committee was absolutely Tory. And I wonder actually, Johnny, if that bit is starting to to, to, to filter through now, that this is not so much in, in, in the way that, you know, the NP scandal, the, the expenses scandal of a decade ago was one of those that that really did in, just engulfed every party. I mean, no member mm. of parliament, no party came out of that well. Every single mm. person had, uh, you know, mud on them from, from that. Is that not happening here? I mean, I was looking at that poll now. I mean, it's 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 been predominantly a story up to now of um, uh, of the Tories having a solid a solid enough lead because Labour can't make any uh, uh, any headway into it, but that seems to have changed. I think it has changed. I think it is going to stick, and I think it'll keep sticking. Not just because the predominant rule breaking seems to be on the Conservative side of the House, but I'm actually more interested in the stuff that isn't explicitly against the rules, but is clearly dodgy and immoral despite being within the rules so one story that the bbc broke this evening was about mps of which there are 15 who are renting out houses they own in london mm. while renting mm. other flats in london and claiming the rent for those as their parliamentary residents that's not against the rules but for me as a taxpayer and as a member of the country i think that is absolutely horrific of those for 15 13 are Tories, three of them are ministers, and none of them have been named yet. That kind of thing will stick. It's not that they're breaking rules. It's not that they're technically behaving badly, but people won't like it. And I agree with Georgia completely that Labour do have to provide some sort of viable alternative. But the thing is now, or I think the word you used, Georgia, was credible, and I agree with that. But the thing now is it's very hard to see what's credible about this government. They've handled a lot of things very badly. They're going from crisis to crisis, U-turn to U-turn. Keir Starmer is absent. And there are suggestions, there were suggestions today from a Jeremy Corbyn biographer that the reason why he's absent is that allegedly there was some instance where Corbyn had to stop him from undertaking some quite significant legal work on the side, which would have been legal in every sense, I suppose, but you know, <laughs> possibly not a great look. Mm. And people are now saying he has to be quiet because... He, as Georgia again said, is not whiter than white. But I think the conservative, conservatives are sort of 
creating their own problems. And I don't think Labour have to do a great deal other than sort of be quiet and point. Mm. This is this is a really key bit as well, isn't it, um, uh, uh, Georgia? That the the, the, the... The, the sort of the, the, the Westminster voted intention and the, the party polling is one thing, but individual polling is really fascinating as well. YouGov going into this weekend uh, has Starmer on twenty nine, that's up four. Johnson on twenty seven, that's down four. And and this this not sure bracket, which has been perhaps the defining feature of uh, of, of polling in the last couple of years, really, I guess. Uh, but forty one percent saying that they are not sure. So there's a hell of a there's a hell of a, 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 a constituency of people to be played for there, Georgia. Um, but a bit of a change in the guard. And and look, you know, when you talk about you talk about Boris Johnson, you know, we've talked endlessly about him being sort of electorally untouchable, and it doesn't matter what he does, and you know, he's got so much political capital, and it's all kind of baked in and and we've been waiting for the moment where it's no longer baked in or or and and the line is crossed and i just wonder if this is it is this is this that moment personally for him um i think that the sort of um that that approach to boris johnson was mistaken from the start really i can see why people sort of sort of went with it um but i think the main reason why he you know won as well as he did uh, leading the conservative party at the last election was because people sort of uh they were very confused about labor stance on brexit um a lot of other sort of obviously scandals associated with corbyn and him being seen as very far left which you know respectably he is he is very far on the left of the labor party um i think it was more to do with that rather than people sort of you know loving boris johnson seeing him as as uh, you know incredibly virtuous mm. or skilled um and personally i very much had my doubts from the start i see him as um sort of uh re you know reading his journalism and his political record i think he's sort of he's quite sort of morally eclectic um it, it, you know his writing was quite interesting in that morally, way when he's morally, ecle morally eclectic <laughs> i'm morally <laughs> eclectic i've heard that one before <laughs> that's a hell Obviously, of that's a hell know. of a statement no it's a hell of a, no you make you make you make your point georgia and you make it well it's uh he, he's a complicated character isn't he that that's hard to pin down for sure and you know the thing that's really interesting is that um is that we, we have actually been here before with 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 these personal leader ratings right where where uh, shortly after keir starmer was elected Labour leader uh he he did well he had a healthy personal lead he, he had a, a really healthy personal rating and that started to sort of steadily started to decline really as a constant uh and then 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 it flipped again during the 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 lockdown the second lockdown um uh, when people were obviously sort of really annoyed with the fact that the government had led us led us back into this situation and in january earlier uh, earlier on this year the start of the year january when we were when we were back in the third lockdown uh that happened but what uh, it happened again and starmer uh, took the lead in those personal ratings over Boris Johnson. But what has been a consistent every time that that has happened is a moment of national, um, uh, I guess, you know, positivity with coming out of a lockdown, right? Coming out of a lockdown situation. And Boris Johnson has been able to go onto the television and hail the triumph of the, the vaccine rollout or hail Freedom Day and talk about going to the pub and having a pint and, you know, going to the match and all that kind of stuff. And we don't have one of those ahead of us, right? We don't have one of those moments well, again. Well, okay. <laughs> I wouldn't Let's, speak to I'm you gonna, soon. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop. I'm going to stop talking before I jinx that. Um, uh, Georgia, stay there. Johnny Burroughs with us as well on the panel on talk radio tonight uh, more next hang about online on dab and on the talk radio app talk radio offense archaeology on twitter quite terrifying don't beg jeff bezos charge him for god's sake have a day off across the uk online on dab plus and on the talk radio app late night with daryl morris on talk radio my Friday panel are with you tonight on Talk Radio. Johnny Burrow, broadcaster and uh, journalist, and Georgia Gilhurley as well, who is a journalist, taking us through some of the big stories of the week. Um, a story in the, uh, I think in the Times, a couple of others have picked it up as well, but um, a story that's that's caught quite a lot of attention today from Durham University and the Students' Union at Durham University, who have been criticised for running uh, classes or training courses 
uh, for people working in the uh, in the sex industry, in the adult industry. Um, and it, 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 you know, it's a weird one. This it's a bit complicated. This isn't it? Because there was a whole out, lot of outrage around this earlier on today, particularly because the headline uh, in most of the newspapers was Durham University uh, uh, issue or offer uh, sex worker courses. Um, that isn't really what's happening here. What's happening here is safety courses. Uh, for those people who work in the sex industry, sex uh, um, sex workers. Uh, but the question marks, I suppose, still remain, and there are still some furious tweets from some people saying that this is outrageous and others suggesting that actually, you know, this is going to happen um, and, and it's a totally reasonable thing to offer. Johnny, where do we stand? Well, the place where I stand first is that the Times article, which is what kicked this all off, is ridiculous and it's it's hugely disappointing because the headline they have run is a deliberate and disingenuous attempt to misinterpret and misrepresent what's happened they say durham university trains its students to be sex workers and as you've said no they don't that's not what they're doing what durham university have done is they've recognized that an estimated six to seven percent of current university students are involved in sex work in some capacity mm. and so the student union is laying on classes to say listen if you're doing this already which is the crucial distinction here are the things you can do to be safe to make and, sure and you're will, not being exploited i will say johnny and uh, not not because i'm not because i'm in the same building as them and I'm, I'm, I'm worried about them coming up and putting me in a headlock if i don't uh, but they did change their headline earlier on this afternoon and they uh, they changed it yeah they've changed it to durham university offers safety training uh, for student sex workers so uh, they so they did amend their <laughs> they did amend their article a, a, a little bit if they if they're listening downstairs please don't come up well, and well, uh, give is, me the headlock but no it's a but the issue but, here yeah, no, the criticism is fair the criticism is fair right? no because, it is but the damage is done as yeah, well, because yeah. the thing that kicks off the argument was actually a tweet from Labour MP Diane Abbott. And the headline on that tweet, by the way, has not updated because it was tweeted however many times in outrage, which presumably was the initial aim, with that headline. It's really silly. Um, the Durham Student Union have issued a statement saying, listen, we do this in the same way that we offer courses to help with people who may have issues with drug abuse or alcohol abuse. I mean, if you ran a course saying listen, if you've ended up taking heroin, here are the things you can do to take heroin more safely. Mm. That is so much better than pretending that people aren't taking heroin or pretending that people aren't sex workers. People are engaging in sex work, whether we like it or not. And actually pretending it doesn't exist doesn't keep those people safe. Educating them probably does. Mm. Um, uh, Georgia, I'm not sure. I've seen some tweets from you today that would suggest you don't agree. <laughs> um so i actually do agree with you johnny that of course the times article um though i've cancelled my subscription so it's paywall so i only saw a bit of it um <laughs> i think you can all see from the headline what they were trying to get at and i think that durham isn't sort of you know directly training its students to perform you know certain sex work acts or whatever however i do think that the narrative around this has become a bit fuzzy and I'm not particularly comfortable with it. I think that the the sort of progressive way of approaching this nowadays and also sort of, you know, the right wing free market liberal approach, whatever, is to sort of say, you know, sex work is just like any other form of work, blah, blah, blah. And I think it's quite telling that you, Johnny, referred to it sort of in the same sentence as you did a heroin addiction. I wouldn't, I wouldn't compare those two things directly, but I think the reality is that I think that whatever university should be doing in terms of this, I think that it should be helping people, um, uh, especially let's say as the majority of people globally who are in sex work, most of them women, most of them are not, you know, sort of enjoying it. They're doing it because they're forced into our poverty. And I think that's a reality that some, let's say, quote unquote, sex positive activists, most of whom haven't been involved in sex work themselves, they're not familiar with that sort of gritty reality. Mm. And I think that obviously this story has been a bit sensationalized, but I think that Diane Abbott's sort of basic comments that sex work is, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, it is exploitative and wrong. I think that she's absolutely correct in saying that whatever the sort of, the way the story was framed, you know, was wrong. But, but on that, on that, Georgia, I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right. Although I, I think, 
I don't think it will be 99.9% in the sense that in the era of kind of cam goal work or I suppose cam person work because everybody's at it or only fans, there are people doing it because they want to do it. But also, and that, and even in the... And actually, that's, that, where that, that's slightly different, isn't it? To... Can, can, let's, let's be clear what we're talking about here because actually that's slightly different, isn't it? Because we've done a lot on this show about about uh, about only fans and about the porn industry and about so often actually this industry that actually for the... Which which actually is um, is quite legitimate and has a lot of people who, who you know, dedicate their lives and their career to it and particularly only fans that can be very empowering for for women uh, uh particularly and you know actually there's been great strides to make it to make it safe and to make it legitimate and to make it you know to make it a better environment for those people who do do it because they want to do it um and we see i think the vast majority of people now actually are, are in that bracket sex work where you are uh, you know the, the 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 industry of prostitution is different to that isn't it well these, these are two different things we're talking about was that, was that, was that a, fair, a fair thing to point out um, I suppose it depends who you're talking to, really. Um, I guess it's part of the sex trade, but I suppose OnlyFans... Uh, d it depends what you're doing on it, really, I guess, whether it whether it qualifies yeah. as yeah. sex work, but it's not a physical thing. It's very different. And actually, um, if you read uh, Julie Bindle, you know, the famous feminist uh, journalist and academic, she's written quite a detailed book on this called Abolishing the Sex Work Myth. And she talks about how a lot of these activists who are very, very pro promoting sex work in general including prostitution and you know which globally it involves you know massive amounts of human trafficking people forced into it due to poverty yeah, etc yeah, yeah, yeah. most of the people who are leading in the activism have been involved in say something quite you know quote unquote soft like webcam work yeah so i think and i that... guess i guess the i guess the argument though remains the same though doesn't it it's about because it's about making it safe right and it's about it's about mm. creating an environment that you know that i mean the reality is that the the, the quote from uh, uh, jonah graham the union's welfare saying you know that actually the reality is that rising costs of higher education push people into these kind of situations and they're going to be there anyway and so we can do something to make it safe or we can bury our head in the sand about it interesting point though interesting debate really nice to talk to you both tonight we're out of time i'm afraid which is always a always a uh,